Hi everyone, welcome to Farsight's Biotech and Health Extension Salon, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. Really, really happy to see so many people joining here and really, really happy to have Suraj, to, Suraj today. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit uh, with us, with the entire group, and I think this should be really like a really wonderful back and forth, home, uh, homeasis for healthy aging and longevity. Um, and we'll be de- just doing a free, free flow talk, um, started off by uh, Suraj, and then afterwards, uh, you can just try and jump in with a bunch of questions that you have, and we're really trying to make it as open as possible. And so there'll be no slides, and it should be really like a formal uh, discussion, really. Uh, and so and whenever you have any questions, um, perhaps feel free to already raise your hand or just uh, collect them in the chat, and I'll be monitoring. Um, and uh, and then I think we can just move on to a discussion as soon as possible. I'll share a little bit more about you, Suresh, in the chat here. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And yeah, with that being said, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Namaste. I am sitting in the city of Aarhus, Denmark, where it is now seven o'clock, three minutes over seven in the afternoon. Uh, And I am very excited and a little bit uh, scared also of talking to this group of people who are very well aware of what is going on in the field of aging and the so-called anti-aging. I'm happy to see some of the familiar names also there. So the idea is, as I was uh, advised by the organizers, that I can talk uh, 20, 25 minutes to set the framework uh, about what I think about hormesis and aging and what can and cannot be done. And then depending upon uh, your interest and your questions and uh, specificity, we will discuss about, uh, further anything you like. So talking about hormesis, I don't know whether this term is familiar to all of you, but I will just give you the background. Hormesis is the phenomenon for which uh, there are many other terms used before, like adaptive response or the dose response relationship in the shape of J-shaped curve or reverse J-shape or U-shaped curve. Uh, so, So these are various previously used terms. Now, normally we try to use an umbrella term hormesis, which is basically a dose response relationship between anything or specifically more which can be potentially toxic at the higher doses. That what is the relationship? Is it linear uh, relationship or linear threshold relationship or linear uh, non-threshold relationship? And actually about the history of this phenomenon of hormesis and this controversy about dose response, the nature of the dose response curve. Just about two weeks ago, an excellent, excellent 22 episode long interview has been released by uh, the group called the Health Physics Science, yeah? or, or is it Health Science Physics, Health Science Physics, uh, where they have interviewed our uh, present leader in the field of hormesis, uh, Professor Ed Calabaris from University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he's talking on an average of about 20 minutes each episode for 22 episodes, giving the full history and controversy about what is actually the toxicological curve. Most of the story is about the radiation-based uh, research and how much personal things were at stake from 1910 onwards kinds of uh, frauds are happening, kind of uh, uh, some bosses forcing their ideas and then the controversies associated with atomic bomb. It's an excellent, excellent uh, documentary, which is a historical uh, event. And I just finished watching it three days ago. So that is where you can get everything about what is the history of this dose response controversy. When we give something to something, is it just proportional? If there is a toxic thing, will it become more toxic at higher dose and on and on? And therefore, it's a linear curve or it is a hormetic curve, which is biphasic and, uh, uh, and dose responsive in that nature. A uh, few years ago, those of us who have been working in this field of hormesis, then we wrote a combined paper, I think in about 2007, about 50 of us, uh, polishing the terminology of hormesis further, especially as relevant to biological systems. Like that's where the concepts of preconditioning, strengthening, hardening, physiological hormesis, post-conditioning, these kind of terms came. And it's the physiological hormesis which is the most relevant 
uh, for me and for the people working in the field of aging. And what is physiological hormesis is that it is again a biphasic dose response where some things which can be actually physiologically harmful or even lethal uh, in a higher dose at a chronic level exposure or severe exposure can have totally opposite effects in terms of health beneficial or physiologically beneficial effects. That is the hormesis. And physiological hormesis is at low level repeated exposure to low level stress can be health beneficial. And the paradigm for that in physiological hormesis is exercise. What is good about exercise biochemically? Nothing. Exercise is perhaps one of the worst things we can do to our body. Because when we are doing exercise, it produces millions of more free radicals. It produces more acids. A lot of cells are dying. But everybody knows that after moderate exercise and over a period of time, during repeated exercise, you get health benefits which are not only limited to the muscles you are, you are exercising, but it works at the whole body level. Running in the gym or walking uh, outside, which I do every day about an hour, not only improves my muscle strength and stamina, it improves my immune system. It improves my uh, cognition. It improves my memory. It improves my mood. And there are data showing it improves libido. It improves almost everything. And exercise has also been shown to even beat many of the drugs which are used to control sugar levels. So exercise performs better. So that is actually our paradigm of hormesis, where you don't need any more convincing that low level stress of your own choice. That's where this word for human beings become very important. The stress of choice at low level and repeated will lead to cumulative at, at an individual round of that stress exposure. The effect may be very, very small or just below the measurable uh, levels or within the statistical uh, variation, which can be handled by having the large sample. But so taking exercise as our starting point of health beneficial stress, stress of choice, that's where the people in the field of aging also started getting interested into that. In my own lab, almost about uh, uh, 25 years ago, when after an equal number of years in the field of aging as a molecular biologist and doing all this basic uh, reductionistic kind of science in the field of aging, I realized that we have learned some very, very important things within the field of aging. And if we want to do something about aging, that's a different reason. What do, you, what do we want to do? And why do we want to do? And we won't go into those sociological and psychological discussion here right now. But what I understood was that, okay, what, what have I learned in the field of aging? That everybody also mentioned that aging is a very complex process and very dynamic process, which evolution has allowed to happen without creating any specific genes to happen. Yeah, evolution has not created any gerontogenes or any killer mechanisms to get rid of the individual body. Because, and that's the evolutionary theory of aging, which has discussed it tremendously, that evolution has worked its best to assure longevity to a species so that it can perform its function or purpose of life which Darwinian theory will say, continuation of generation. And for that, each species requires certain time period, which we call the essential lifespan, or people like Olshansky have been calling it warranty period. Yeah? So you need certain time span to survive and reproduce. But after that, evolution has not bothered either to maintain us or to kill us. The maintaining could have been easier, but it was not required. There was nothing uh, selection pressure left. But then creating the killing mechanisms was also not required. But the maintenance mechanisms were as everything else in evolution, nothing is perfect. Actually, nature, nothing is perfect. In sociology, sometimes we would like to believe we are the perfect image in the, 
image of somebody other perfect, but nothing in nature, nothing in science is perfect. So basically, what we understood that aging is the result of imperfections of our living mechanisms. They do pretty well for a long time, which for Homo sapiens is around up to 45 years. But after that, things are allowed to happen more and more in exponential way because there is no evolutionary pressure to eliminate them or avoid them. So that's first thing. There is no enemy inside my body. And then in 50 years, hundreds of scientists have done tremendous work showing what happens during aging at the level of various species, various populations within the species, within individuals, within the systems within an individual, organs within an individual, cells, molecules, everything is basically worked out. And it's a great, great achievement. And we can draw this reductionistic picture beautifully from any level to any level. And you, at the metabolome, you can just correlate everything to everything, which is fantastic. Yeah. Now the situation comes, okay, so if I want to do anything about old age, because people are afraid of getting old, nobody likes to be called old, nobody's looking forward to becoming old. Yeah, if somebody tells me, oh, Suresh, you have such an experience and wise man, you look like 90 years old, I won't take it com as a compliment. I would rather take a, reduce it as my compliment. Why? What's wrong in becoming old? Yeah, everything is wrong. Biologically, there is nothing to look forward to. That is true. So that is why we need biomedicine, another thing that if we want to continue to live, we need to do something about it. And depends upon on what. Now comes the problem is that what do we want to do? The things which we have learned, such tremendous thing, all the way down to individual DNA molecules, RNA, protein, enzymes, you name any metabolome, but and it is related. So like major things which are in fashion these days, like TOR pathway or telomeres or methylation or glycation. Well, I can name 20, 30, 40. Sometimes I ask my uh, writers of, uh, for my journal, Biogerontology, when they show the correlation of this thing with aging. And I say, can you show me something which does not relate with aging? Yeah, where you can show the experiment that this thing actually doesn't relate and only my, this pathway relates. Most of the interventional studies at the moment, which are very, very convincing, powerful, and a lot of money is invested into that. And they will all have different levels of uh, utilization. Uh, take up one thing at a time that if you are interested in having mTOR pathway, can I find some chemicals, some intervention which can inhibit that, either stimulate or inhibit or activate approaches to all these correlated molecules. Yeah, that can be telomere length, that can be methylation, that can be glycation, that can be anything you talk about. That is the main approach, either stim finding for stimulators or inhibitors or some kind of active uh, activity activators. And most of these things do work in those experimental systems when we read the papers. And most of these experimental systems are known in human. It's very, very difficult to show things in human, both due to uh, experimental systems, nature, and due to ethical uh, reason. But the problem is that going from bottom to upward is almost mm, impossible in many situations because we assume the paradigm of body as a machine because body has shown this, this things are going wrong. And if I can start uh, tuning, fine tuning this uh, screw and that screw, it will come back to the natural condition. No, body as a machine paradigm does not work in biological systems. Biological systems are dynamic, especially these things like aging, where when you interfere with one part, even if you inhibit it, it may not immediately show any even toxic effects because there is the power of adaptation, there is compensation, there is bypassing. So if you want to do something about aging and, uh, and if you don't want to target any specific disease, then we have to have some other approach. And what I understood during all my research career, that aging is basically 
a progressive loss of health, our failure of maintenance of health, which in some of my writings, I could created the concept of that our health can be defined in terms of homeodynamic space. There is no homeostasis in any living system. We are just used to using this 100 year old term, homeostasis, show me where is homeostasis. Homeostasis means same state. No, it's homeodynamic. Yeah, that was the term coined in 1994 by Yates in uh, England, that biological systems are dynamic systems. They try to maintain that whole dynamicity. I change while I'm the same. So not calling stat a static system. So then we created the concept of homeodynamic space as a surviving ability, as a buffering capacity, which has three major components of homeodynamic space, which determine whether I am living or not living, whether I'm healthy or not healthy. First is stress response. Biological systems have such fantastic series of stress responses to basically counteract any external or internal disturbance. Every time I breathe, I create disturbance. Yeah. But the body has the systems which uses that disturbance as my driving machinery. Uh, well, I shouldn't use the same <laughs> language of the body as a machine. Uh, but stress responses are the basis of our day-to-day -day survival and our overall longevity. And I will talk a little bit more about how we use stress responses for hormesis because that's the foundation of hormesis. Then the second part of homeodynamic space is uh, damage control. Whatever damages are happening, can the system either remove the damage or repair the damage or even eliminate the damaging source, you know, counteract uh, the things like free radicals or whatever other things might be. The third part of the homeodynamic space is what we call constant remodeling, which is most uh, visible in the case of immune system and, and the skeletal system. There is a constant remodeling going on all the time, which is adaptation, turnover, and other thing. And at the molecular level, same thing happens at the proteins and everywhere else. So these are the three pillars of homeodynamic space. And the practical definition with some, some of us in biogerontology and I, especially in my research have been using for aging, aging is the progressive shrinkage of the homeodynamic space. We are all born with certain level of homeodynamic space in a so-called normal conditions, which becomes better and better during growth, development, and peak of the youth. But when aging sets in, which sets in after essential lifespan, this shrinkage starts happening. And the vulnerable zone around homeodynamic space becomes larger and larger. And the main reason for this change is, which I have already referred to, imperfect systems. We are not perfect. We continue to live. We continue to uh, uh, do all this biochemical metabolism, but we are not perfect. And as a result, things change in spite of all these adaptive things. So for me, okay, I have taken almost 15 minutes on that, but I should uh, uh, try to speed up a little bit now. So then the thing came, if I want to maintain health, I need to use some, not a single target approach, which is the most uh, successful, which is also based on the idea that uh, we need to do something, otherwise we will have diseases. No, instead of frightening me with a disease fear, I would like to have, I want to maintain my health or recover my health or enhance my health, for which I also need other arguments. Why should I be healthy? Not because they will give me disease in 40 years time. That doesn't work usually on human mind. Just like if somebody tells me, uh, morality and ethics with the fear of hell is usually doesn't work. I have to understand why should I be ethical and moral now? Why should I be healthy now? So for me, health is the one which we need to do something about and then all other consequences will follow. Some diseases will be prevented or some uh, managed well or lifespan. So I'm not worried about that part. So how to improve health as such, that's where hormesis came in with the paradigm of uh, exercise. That if you give repeated mild stress to a system, although for the human beings we use the word uh, stress of choice, 
But when I did my experiments with the cells in culture, they didn't have a choice. So I was just choosing a mild dose of heat shock. That was the, one of the earliest experiments we did because there was so much molecular biology known about heat shock. So I chose more heat shock uh, as a stressor because it was easy to do in the laboratory. You just shift the cell from 37 degree incubator into a 41 degree heat shock water bath and for one hour, and then you let them recover. And I kept on doing this thing twice a week throughout this fibroblast hay flick system. And cells stopped showing many, many signs of aging. And they lived a little bit extra, a few more passages. So that was the original observation which I did in my uh, laboratory. Uh, and then there were several MSc theses and PhD theses done on whatever we could measure. And since then, a lot of people have been using many other kinds of these protocols by having mild stress, there has been gravity uh, on drosophila. There are all these nutritional components. So we will talk about these a little bit more. So together for the purposes of uh, discussion and understanding, I call all such mild stressors, which have the potential to create physiological hormesis as hormetins, just a kind of a word to uh, focus on. And when you give a stress, what is the first response of the cells? The cells uh, notice that they have been disturbed. Like if I give a heat shock, the first thing which happens in the cells is induction of heat shock proteins by activating the heat shock factors, which have noticed there is some protein denaturation. They run towards the a nucleus and they start producing new proteins, which are heat shock proteins. And those then start doing their job in the cell. Similarly, an oxidative stress, which most of the time so-called uh, all these things coming from spices or curcumin, or uh, they go in the cell and they create some kind of disturbance when NRF2 pathway gets activated and hundreds of antioxidative genes get activated. And we start calling the original stressor as an antioxidant. No. That stressor like curcumin didn't do anything as an antioxidant. Biologically, we see antioxidative effect. So these are hormetins. And there are seven major pathways of stress in a cell, which in a very recent review article I wrote for current opinions in toxicology, I draw this picture that we can divide stressors, either chemical stressors, physical stressors, and biological stressors. And the main seven pathways, like if there is nutritional deficiency, this is the autophagy, which will be the primary stress response, followed by everything else might happen. And oxidative stress will cause NRF2 pathway. Uh, again, energy deficiency stress will cause sirtuin pathway. Inflammatory stress will cause inflammation and FK beta pathway to take over. You know, same thing, the DNA damage uh, well, inducing stress will cause DNA repair response. So there are seven major pathways. And if any stressor induces one or more of these pathways, first primary and secondary, and if the system can take it, it will result into physiological hormesis, which can be health beneficial. And in the last 30 years, there have been now hundreds and hundreds of papers published using lots and lots of different types of stressors. Most of the work is on the chemical and nutrition-based stressors, all these extracts from plants or individual components, which induce either NRF2 or what we call calorie restriction mimetics. They use autophagy or resveratrol, goes through sirtuin stress pathway. All these are hormetic pathway, and that's where there is a lot of uh, potential to develop commercially possible either single hormetin interventions or multi hormetin interventions combining physical and uh, nutritional and uh, biological uh, hormetins. And recently in this paper, I have also tried to create a nomenclature for various hormetins, like based on the stress response. Any stress which will induce autophagy that will come under the category of hormetin A. Any stress Sorry, which is DNA. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. I want to, because I do have to go soon. I want to ask you a question and your thoughts. 
as I understand it, with things like autophagy and perhaps other hormetic stresses, it's actually a two-phase process. There's the stress and the stress response. So mm -hmm. for instance, the heat shock proteins get made or the autophagy, autophagic factors, the yamanaka factors, whatever they are, get made. Mm -hmm. And all the damaged stuff gets contained and recycled. But mm -hmm. then, then the stress gets released. Like you find some nutrition after a mm -hmm. period of caloric deficit or the heat goes away. And now you get redifferentiation and resynthesis of fresh molecules to replace mm -hmm. the damaged ones. Do you believe that's a general hormetic thing where you cycle the hormesis and that you get a recycling of the damaged stuff followed by a reproduction of fresh stuff? Definitely. Well, that is going on in the basic metabolism all the time. The hormetin that is going on uh, even in the example of exercise. Yeah. So there is a remodeling and break and uh, taking care happening. But what hormesis will, does it just to challenge it a little bit more where you get this extra benefit. So that is working, adding on to what we already have. Yeah. So instead of having this enemy oriented approach that we, there is something going wrong and we want to fix it, we are trying to help the system which already is trying to survive that maybe by challenging is it a little bit. That's why in English language, the, the word challenge is better for this uh, physiological hormesis. The, the challenge can be met. So, so there is a nomenclature created that what kind of hormetins, A, D, E, H, I, O, the seven uh, hormetins can be discovered and tested and used. And there is some interest from the um, so-called anti-aging uh, industry or the health industry uh, in the hormetins, like one of the first examples came actually from a cosmetic company who, who tested some compounds, which according to their ways of testing were having some uh, skin care uh, applications. But when they wanted to study mechanisms, that was creating all kinds of stress. And basically, and then they approached us and then with the help of some outside lab, we were able to show that actually that compound was creating so much stress markers and those were the things doing whatever potentially good things were going to happen. So there can be hormetin-based products. But this hormetin at the moment has many challenges to uh, sort out, which I am sure that will come in the questions. So my, I will wind up with the, this basic message because I was told about hormesis to concentrate on the hormesis. That for hormesis, for me, is uh, what that overused word, holistic approach for maintaining, improving, and enhancing health. And maintenance of health is perhaps more uh, possible and accessible and sellable issue than targeting on individual diseases or even multiple diseases. Yes, when a disease is there, that's a matter of life and death and acute situation. And all those things which are being done in biomedicine are fantastic. But if we want to actually have healthy aging and healthy longevity, we have to concentrate on how to measure health because that's another challenge. We don't know how to measure health without involving the concept of disease and how to then monitor it when we interfere with something how do I know that I, I am a little bit better healthy today than yesterday? But hormesis and hormetin, for me, these have actually taken up all my uh, lifelong experience in the field of aging into this pathway, that this is what has the possibility to develop both commercially and <clears throat> intellectually to answer questions both in health and aging and survival and longevity. So thank you. I will. Welcome any questions, any comments, criticisms uh, you have to share with me. Wonderful. Okay. That was... It was about half an hour. Yeah. Like exactly, pretty much. Um, okay. okay. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well done without slides. Uh, did you keep you from half an hour? That was, uh, that was um, yeah, really eloquent and I think uh, good for understanding. Uh, we already have a few questions lined up. Uh, first one from John slash Aaron, that's on Sona. And then we have Carl, Christine, Abdul Kader. And if anyone else wants to jump in afterwards, either say it in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, uh, John, Aaron, you go first on your Sona question. Hi, Suresh. It's good to see you again. Yep. I remember well the um, IABG conference that you organized almost 20 years ago in Arhus. 
John Farber, um, I remember you. We even sometimes write. Uh, <laughs> rarely are you right. Yes, please go ahead. I'm very interested in sauna because I've been hearing a lot of it on Rhonda Patrick's um, uh, podcast, uh, Found My Fitness. Mm -hmm. And she's talking about um, Nordic saunas that maybe are 20 minutes several times a week mm -hmm. at uh, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. And I wonder if you have looked into this, if you think that's a good prescription and how does that compare with say a hot tub or what's called a, a um, infrared sauna, which looks mm -hmm. like maybe it's just a, a gadget that you would buy and not really use. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on saunas? Yeah, there has been a very recently, a very good paper coming from these habits of fin, uh, Finland sauna, the one you mentioned. Uh, yes. I, Look, for hundreds of years in these countries, sauna has been promoted and used and practiced, and especially in Finland yeah, and the Sweden, the Norway, which are colder than Denmark. This is a daily habit, and people feel good about it. And nobody claims any major disease prevention or treatment, but this is like, because feeling good is an important component of feeling healthy. To the best of my knowledge, there are not too many systematic studies done on sauna that how it is health beneficial. I was approached by some dry sauna maker companies uh, about five or six years ago. They wanted us to test their sauna to show whether it induces any kind of stress response. Yeah? And we were then asking that, yes, okay, this will, can be done, but we need these two people to take blood, how many volunteers, and I gave them a little budget calculation, and that's where they ran away. Yeah, no, 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 no. We will give you free sauna for six months, and you just uh, do any experiments you like. I said, even if we show one single heat shock protein emerging, sitting in your uh, sauna, your company is going to make maybe a lot of story out of it. That is the problem with the sauna people. No systematic study has been financed and it has not been done. But I strongly believe that under some conditions, you don't have to have high levels of inductions of, uh, say, heat shock proteins. It's just like exercise. If, nobody, if you have never been to exercise and you suddenly go for exercise, on one round of exercise, you may not see anything except bad things maybe. Yeah, not even heat shock thing. So... These are repeated things which need to be done. And I personally believe that I started then uh, taking a bit more sauna myself, which in Denmark was not that easy. So that's why hot water bath habit. Again, we have no idea that when I'm sitting at 40 degrees Celsius uh, in my bathtub, I like to do it at least once a week, whether at some stage, some stress response is happening. Because if stress response is happening, which can be measured either in my saliva or my blood, and even minor issue of HSP-70 synthesis, or a, that will be a great example. But otherwise, to practice it from folk knowledge, historical knowledge, combined with the basic principles of uh, hormesis, I, I believe in sauna, although I'm not practicing it because it's not accessible to me easy. <laughs> Thank you. I guess... <laughs> Okay, okay that, that leads into my thing, which is, um, so there's no data on, this is like really ridiculous, like the sauna is being pushed a lot. And I, I agree, it's probably inducing heat shock response, mm -hmm. but we don't have data about like what temperature, how long it should be at, what's the equivalent, like a hot shower can scald you. So therefore it can mm -hmm. create sauna temperatures, right? So how long would you, would standing in a hot shower at what temperature be equivalent to whatever a sauna's benefit is we don't have any data there's no data on that right at this no, point no no okay. that is the whole thing it, there, there just, are no systematic studies no, uh, no data. Uh, it seems so simple it's just like such a low-hanging fruit okay yeah um, so and then there's no there's do you, you have any plans on doing something like this in the near future or well no i am professor emeritus so i don't have a active research lab well, first of all, okay. and also, even if I had the lab, I was a molecular biologist working on the hay flick system in cell culture. So there with the heat shock, we did tremendous amount of work. How did we choose the uh, temperature for the human fibroblasts that they can take it again and again for 200 times? So there were all these titrations done. Yeah, that we were 
we could induce maximum heat shock response at say 43 degrees Celsius. But if we give 43 degree more than once or twice, cells die. So then I have to do titration. What about 42? What about 41? What about 39? Now we did five temperatures and then we chose 41. Why we chose? Again, only intuition because I made a cut point that I will choose the condition where it's only 30% of the maximum response. Again, don't ask me what was the logic behind it. <laughs> Why not 25%? Why not 40%? I could do all that, but I needed then more people to work and do these experiments that these were expensive. So I chose that and that's where some sociology and psychology comes in because then I said, okay, I come from India and also in many other cultures, there is always this combination of three things, Trinity, Trinity. We have Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, everything goes in Trinity. Also in Christianity, there is, yeah, Father, Mother, Satan and whatever. So by one third and somehow it worked fantastically well, yeah. Each experiment was taking 350 days to complete. That's the Hayflick system experiment. So, so we could not do many combinations. So it's the same story there that maybe some other combination will be better. Then comes recovery. When should the next exposure be given? Because when you are giving heat shock or sauna treatment, you are not getting the benefits immediately. You are inducing stress pathways. The benefits will come during recovery period, just right. as physical exercise. You don't get any benefit during exercise. Yeah. But after. So when should it be the next round of uh, sauna? So in our cell culture system, then we found out that I need to give enough time to the cells so that they come back to their basal level, but five to 10% higher, not more than that, only about five to 10% higher than their original basal. And then I can give another round where 30% induction happens and accumulate. Okay. These things can be done, yeah, in modern ways, by uh, with taking human, uh, we did some experiments with the human lymphocytes uh, because we were relating with the stress response genes. That, But then again, that's an invasive technique. You need to have the blood and separate, and then you can find out what will be optimal for this person, the heat shock response. But that's a very, very important thing, but it is doable if people are willing to invest money for and I can definitely advise how to do it and where to do it. <laughs> I have more questions, but we'll let's get around to everybody else first. <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, just a little note in here. Um, if you want to study the benefits of the Nordic sound and increase the sales of Nordic sound, then obviously it's very important to look at the temperature that goes up and down by one degree. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a daily user of a sauna, and what we notice in the sauna is you, you put a little bit of water, you increase the humidity at the same temperature, you get much, much stronger reaction. Hmm. And if you look, uh, many cultures have this heat shock that they, they use. In, in more Southern cultures, you have the hammam, mm -hmm. which is 40 degrees Celsius, that's 30 degrees below the sauna temperature, mm. but it's extremely saturated in humidity. And they have the same response. Um, Roman Empire, a uh, thousand years ago, they, they used it. Uh, what they did is they would go and jump into the cold pool after the sound that Ooh. they were doing. And so clearly the heat shock is the key there. Mm -hmm. And it's creating some difference in temperature and going out of physiological comfort. Um, and it's not that much about what's the exact temperature or not likely as much about how long you stay in the sauna. Mm -hmm. It is being able to cre create the, the, the physiological discomfort, which is the stressor and, and, and generates response. Yeah, and if, if we can demonstrate the induction of some of the main uh, molecular pathways related with this heat inclusion, that gives you more confidence that yes, the system is working. And that is the difficult part that how to show uh, what kind of heat shock proteins are coming either when I'm sitting in a bathtub or in the sauna is doable, needs a lot of ethical permissions and other things, but that will be wonderful. Again, what I already mentioned briefly, there is so much individual variation also that we will need if we want to make a recommendation to somebody that you should have this heat shock therapy or heat shock treatment. Uh, 
we need to know how his cells are generally responding. There are some people who are fast responders, some are slow responders, some are acute responders. That was, we have already, because there is gene polymorphism, there are so many genes involved in heat shock protein, and we did that, these two PhDs on gene polymorphism of heat shock genes. And there were people, actually those who were responding in a somewhere in between category, you know, I don't remember the exact polymorphism name, they were the longest survivors in that follow-up studies, which we had a different data within, even within the twins, there was a difference in one twin is a, a fast responder and another is a slow responder, although their gene polymorphism was same. So these, so if we want to tell people, we cannot just like exercise, we say 30 minutes for four days a week or five days as if it, beneficial to everybody at all the time. No, it's not. We have to find the ways because there are many also other factors in uh, basically for health. There are three pillars, food, physical activity, and social and mental engagement. And how do we use hormesis in all these three areas is basically the principle of, first of all, pleasure. We have to have pleasure component in that. If you don't like an exercise, it does I was paying to the gym, but I never went there. I thought I have paid the money and now money is doing the job. But then I discovered, though, no, walking is more acceptable to me. And then I incorporated it in my life. Same thing about this kind of thing. What kind of heat, whether with water, dry water, infrared, we will have to consider people's uh, choices also. And then comes moderation and then comes variety. These are the three principles of hormesis that you have to have pleasure part first, together with mo moderation, that it should not be severe of anything, even if it's food or it's a social engagement. And then there should be variety in that, that can you combine various other stress pathways, not only one hormetin. So heat shock will come under physical hormetin category, and that will be a hormetin H, but then you need maybe hormetin N, uh, or hormetin O, which is for the oxidative stress pathway. Those combinations will be needed. That's a perfect lead into my question, which is about combinations. Yes. So given your broad perspective, um, I would love to get your take on the following question, but I'll set the stage first. So um, broadly, I think the tenets of the sort of hormetic idea are, are sort of widely agreed. There's a a U or J shaped dose response curve to a particular thing. Um, and you've got this great way of categorizing the things into certain groups and that's great. Um, and, you know, in terms of research, we've talked a little about how that U shaped mapping has only been patchily um, explored so far by current mm -hmm. science. And, mm -hmm. um, and we just had a deep dive on saunas. Um, Obviously, the different kinds of hormetic modalities have different amounts of science behind them, right? There's lots on fasting and different kinds of dietary restrictions. There's lots on exercise. And even in those areas where there's sort of arguably the most, there's still a pretty there's a lot of disagreement about the yeah. details. Yeah. And then, you know, you get into the areas where there's less science like heat and cold and, you know, even things like intermittent drinking or temporary dehydration yeah. and radi yeah. low dose radiation and all kinds of, so there's all these different modalities, right? As far as I can tell from my cursory glance around all the work in this whole area only ever considers one modality at a time, right? <laughs> so I'm curious for your perspective, what do you think of, you know, the U-shaped curve is a one dimensional versus the response, right? right. In reality, there's a multi-dimensional bowl, you know, a hyper-dimensional bowl of like, how does the body respond to the levels of all these things combined, right? right? So I'm curious, do you think that the introduction of new modalities concomitant, you know, at the same time as one of the other stressors, so adding stressor upon stressor, um, how do you think that changes the, the U-shaped curve's position or shape for a given one as compared to doing it by itself. So, you know, if you do, um, you know, exercise combined with fasting, or if you do heat, heat combined with exercise or, or, you know, dehydration combined with fasting, you know, et cetera, that, you know, my intuition is that, you know, because for the same reason that there's a, a negative, you know, a, a detriment when you get too high of a dose, that having too many stressors will overwhelm the response, the, yeah. the adaptive response. But, uh, you know, is there any work in this area yet? And if even if not, what's your intuition? 
you just said what I wanted to say. These are all my concerns also, that in real life, we are never exposed to one stressor at a time, yeah. not even in the food components. There is so much work on curcumin and all that, a gigantic amount. But does anybody eat curcumin on its own? It's eaten as a part of the food where there are 20 other things. They, but we are still limited by this reductionistic approach, by the biomedical's dominant approach, because those were the drugs against certain targets. The one thing with overwhelm, but in hormesis research, this combination of stresses has not started yet, only very few. Uh, in my own lab, there was one interesting study we did because we were working on, on the nutritional stressor curcumin to show what effects, hormetic effects it has. And then we were working on heat shock. And then we said, can we combine them? So what shall we do? So we did two basic experiments. We first exposed the cells, our again, experiment with the human fibroblast, the Hayflick system, to curcumin for whatever dose we had selected out of many trials or other, that, okay, this is a hormetic dose because it was inducing NRF2 pathways within our conditions and repetition. So we give curcumin and then after one or two hours of recovery period from curcumin, we give them heat shock. And, there's, and the effects which were obtained in heat shock response got synergistically almost five, six times higher than heat shock alone. Yeah? If pre-treatment with curcumin was given, which was inducing NRF2, but then we give heat shock, so the effect of heat shock was five to seven times higher than heat shock alone. Now comes interesting part. When we gave heat shock before, one hour heat shock, 41 degrees, and then after a while, we exposed the cells to curcumins. Within two hours, cells were dead at the same dose. Very, very interesting observation. I will extrapolate it to something like, uh, if I have eaten a very spicy Indian meal and I go to do my exercise, I'm going to get more benefits of exercise than other way around. So if I have gone to exercise first, then I should avoid eating a spicy meal because that may be harmful. It's a testable possibility. Again, we need people to invest money and find out the answer. Same thing. Nobody eats, for example, haldi. Again, curcumin is a pure compound. In reality, we use this uh, turmeric and there are no data on turmeric because turmeric have other, and turmeric is never eaten in Indian food without combination with pepper. So how will turmeric go together with pepper? And then all these questions you raised, that is the biggest challenge for reality part of the hormesis. So, so specific question. So you, um, you phrased the idea of the curcumin first and then um, you know, and then the heat as you got a more benefit from the heat at the same dose. But another yes. way to phrase that is that the U-shaped curve was shifted. Yeah, we don't. Uh, yeah. So did you explore at what dose the heat became detrimental? No. And does then the introduction of the curcumin first reduce the level of that threshold at which the heat becomes detrimental? So that would be a testable hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, scientifically very important and testable hypothesis. Like there are some other examples from exercise and chocolate. Yeah, this my uh, colleague Michael Risto in uh, Sweden, I'm not Sweden, Switzerland, in Zurich. He did this experiments with the people who go for exercise and they get benefit if they were given high antioxidant containing chocolate before going to exercise their benefits for exercise, whatever was going to happen, disappeared. So that was just to show that if your antioxidants taken before exercise take away this new free radical or other things coming, you lose the benefits of exercise because that needs uh, free radicals to be produced. So those are the only one or two papers Michael Risto has published. So these kind of studies people are trying to do, but very, very difficult to perform. And now it comes, uh, AI might help that if individual data from many types, if some computer can combine, but usually people don't do all this curve. They publish data on a standard official linear known threshold pathway 
and they miss the hormetic pathway because the effects are very small, but cumulative and biologically amplified effect, which happen later on. But these are the questions hormesis field needs to answer, needs to answer. Hi, I Thanks. think I'm next. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for this super important topic. I think looking back 10 years from now, they'll be saying, why did we not work on this sooner? Um, I know uh, longevity experimenters who are pursuing some pretty strong oxidative strategies, in particular mm -hmm. hyperbaric oxygen chambers and even um, intravenous ozone. Mm -hmm. I have a, one of my MDs gives himself intravenous ozone on a regular basis. And I have to admit, anecdotally, he looks much younger than he really is. Okay. So do you have, have you, do you have any opinions on this? Have you seen anything interesting on this? Uh, not really. I have only superficially heard about these things, but I will be very interested if those who inject uh, ozone, does it induce or which stress response pathways are induced uh, within a sh very short time? Because that will be the step which will then go towards hormesis. A lot of things can work without involving hormesis, without involving stress pathways. Now, is ozone taken as a stressor by the cell and tries to counteract and which one of those seven is the primary one and then the later one? That will become very interesting. I don't know those, but the effect you say is very tremendous. It might be true. It's, so we cannot just uh, um, say it's a, it's a um, what we call the, psychosomatic or placebo or this thing. After all, what is the biochemistry of placebo? Why does it happen? Yeah, I'm very much interested in understanding the biochemistry of every kind of placebo. Because if it happens, even if it happens in small number of people, we need to understand. Yeah, And then feel good factor, which culturally we know, like sauna comes again, and or some other practices, even yoga. Meditation has been shown to be inducing some stress pathways. And that goes together then with the, uh, the cultural uh, claims that meditation cools you down, makes you feel good and relax you. So all these endpoints cannot be just dismissed if large, if it's a cultural practice. So we can, but everything in cultural practice is also not true. Yeah. The ultimate aim of science is to become common sense. That it becomes yeah. common sense. But everything in common sense may not be right. So we should be able to filter it out. That's where mechanistic studies are important. But we don't have to spend all the time if something starts showing these results. Like if you see this, uh, your friend with ozone, and if one sees 100,000 people in the world going around with that, one will have to consider it seriously. Yeah. You had mentioned there are four principles. Pleasure, moderation, variety, and what? Three. Three principles. Three. Okay. There are three pillars, three pillars of health, food, physical activity, and social and mental engagement. These are the three pillars, but the hormetic way of life will require all these three pillars to follow principles of pleasure, moderation, and variety. And that applies to, basically we use the example of food, you know, especially, especially a lot of things in the food which we eat, they are so dangerous poisons. Plants never wanted them to be eaten, but we have found a way. Uh, how to use it. But then again, I can kill myself even with curcumin and pepper or even with simple water. If I overdo it, it's not. <laughs> I won't demonstrate it here, but. <laughs> Great, thank you. But Ozen, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do want to get to Abdul Kader's question, but I, I always want to make sure that whenever someone comes, I ask two questions. Uh, one of them being, if there's a number one challenge that you'd like other people to solve in your field, what would that be? I think, you know, you already, I think, I guess, mentioned cross-correlation of like different factors. Yeah. And that could maybe be one. And then the second one is how can people help advance your work? So maybe you want to tackle them both. And if we get time, we get to up to cut question afterwards. Yeah. Uh, for me, the biggest challenge here is how to quantify health in an individual. Are there any positive markers of health which can be measured to tell me that whether I am within certain uh, functionally fine levels of homeodynamic space. It's not the opposite of frailty index. Yeah, you know, the frailty index tells how weak you are. And I asked that one of the originators of frailty index, uh, Mitnitsky, who unfortunately died last year, that is health index the reverse of frailty index? And he said, no, it can. He thought about it and then he kept the no. We don't have any actually markers of health. We, 
<coughs> we have been developing various uh, concepts about defining hell. Actually, last year, we brought a big book in my book series explaining hell. We don't know actually how to define a hell. Even WHO's definition of health is so vague, it's a complete state of well-being. So I would like to have both the concepts and the technology created, which with the minimum invasive approach can tell me on a day-to-day -day basis, what is my health status? And then if I do something, that will convince me that my health, this thing is helping me or not. So that is the biggest challenge for me. Even otherwise, like, why I give this example, like about 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with diabetes too, because that runs in my family. So I take metformin and I try to keep track of the reading. But then metformin has certain readings given yeah, up to my blood control. But when I started walking after my office hours, I will walk for an hour before I reach home. And then I measured my glucose. If without walking, the reading was standing somewhere around 10, but after walking, it was coming down to seven. Oh, what a inspiration and incentive it was. Oh, thing is working. My body is responding. Yeah, I have walked. Body is responding. It affects my metabolism. Something similar in health. That's where we need to measure measurements of resilience and robustness. These are the two concepts very important for measuring health. What is resilience and what is robustness? Robustness is maximum level of stress where after which I will die. Resilience is maximum level of stress which I can take, tolerate the damage, and come out of it with some scars. That's the theory of allostasis, for example, you know, the changing color. So that's my biggest uh, uh, challenge, intellectual challenge and technical challenge, how to quantify health at an individual level and if one can monitor it. I think uh, there are some companies in America who are offering some kind of uh, measurements and grip strength and this and that. There's so many, but uh, that's the question I would like your thinkers to address. Well, the biomarkers problem, as I think as Aaron called it in the chat, is definitely something that comes up almost recently. Uh, biomarkers um, of health, not yeah. biomarkers of age or disease or terror or death, biomarker of health. And how do we define health? Yeah. And final question, I know we're on time, but what can people do to help your work along? Is there anything particular? This is a shameless plug moment for your work and uh, what you need to move it further. Well, my contribution as I can see that I can still do is after almost 45 years of active research career, I am actually enjoying my emeritus status, sharing my knowledge, teaching, giving workshops to children. I have this book series, I run Biogerontology Journal. So if anybody thinks that I can contribute or bring new ideas to set new experiments, that I can definitely get involved in. I can monitor experimental progress. I can advise experiments. I can analyze their data. But I don't want to run a lab or apply for ethical permissions to do it. Yeah. But as an advisor, uh, coming back to my Indian culture, yeah, I would like to become a guru in biogerontology, but a very scientific guru, not focus, focus guru. <laughs> wonderful. So the way that people can help you is by you helping them. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> network. <laughs> okay, I think we're over time now. We don't want to take up wonderful. more of you. Thank you so, so much. This was super engaging. Um, and yeah, we hope it wasn't the last time that we saw you. Very interesting stuff. And thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, that was wonderful. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, Thank you, those everybody. If you want more discussion, we're in the Discord chat. Uh, otherwise, I will meet or write you. to me. Or write to me the email, and I will reply. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have Thank a you. Bye. Day.